Hello, my name is Paul Slovic, and I'm excited to take you on a tour today of the uh, psychology of risk, a topic I've been fortunate to study for some 60 years with a lot of fine colleagues. And um, I hope you'll find it as uh, fascinating a topic as, as I do. So uh, let's, uh, let's get right into it. The uh, main message of this lecture is that uh, understanding the psychology of risk and decision making is vitally important as we struggle to manage the enormous human and environmental risks of today and prepare for the challenges of the future. So uh, some important uh, questions that I'll address in my, in my lecture are, how do people think about and make decisions about risk? What factors determine the perception of risk and the acceptance of risk? Why do we fight about some risk issues? What role do emotion, reason, personality, and cultural factors play in risk perception? Why do risk perceptions matter? What are the social, economic, political, health, and safety consequences of risk perceptions? And why do scientists, government officials, business leaders, and health experts also need to understand risk perception? So um, in uh, addressing these questions, I'll draw on research and some of the lessons that uh, research has taught us about risk. For example, uh, risk of, risks of concern change over time and differ between groups and between societies, cultures, and nations. Risk analysis conducted by experts is complex and often controversial. Uh, risk is subjective and value-laden, and the perception and communication of risk can be studied empirically in the laboratory and in the field. Finally, risk perceptions lead to behaviors that can result in enormous personal, social, political, and economic consequences. A few more lessons. Trust is vital for perception, communication, and acceptance of risk. Trust is hard to earn and easy to lose. Uh, most risk perception is determined by fast, intuitive gut feelings rather than by careful deliberation. And finally, understanding risk perception is essential for effective risk communication. So uh, the overview then of uh, the lecture that will address these questions is I'll start with talking about the complexity of risk and the fact that uh, there's a lot of conflict and controversy about risk issues. And uh, then I'll, uh, this uh, also relates closely to the fact that we have multiple ways to define and measure risk. Uh, this is uh, why it's kind of easy to, uh, to uh, debate and, and uh, fight about it. Uh, then I'll go into studies of perceived risk and the uh, differences between experts and laypersons' perceptions some economic and other impacts of perceptions, and this relates to the, something called the social amplification of risk and the fact that there's something called stigma that is uh, a major element in amplifying the importance and the impacts of risk. I'll talk about risk and trust, and uh, throughout the lecture, the, uh, the underlying um, uh, factor that's important is that uh, listening to people and respecting their knowledge and con values and concerns uh, is of the utmost importance in dealing with risk. So uh, first uh, let's look at the complexity of risk, the fact that risk is a complex and controversial concept. And uh, there's something in the overall arching field here is called risk analysis. And it has three components, risk assessment, risk management, and uh, something called politics that I say intervenes between assessment and management. So the assessment of risk has to do with identifying uh, hazards and quantifying them and characterizing them in various ways. And this feeds into risk management, which involves the decision making about risk and determining what risks are acceptable, how safe is safe enough, and communicating and evaluating risk. And in between this path between assessing risk and managing it is uh, something uh, that intervenes that I call politics. And that involves perception of risk, values, issues of uh, process, who makes the decision, uh, and some messy factors such as power and trust that uh, lead often to conflict and controversy. So this is kind of the grand uh, overview of this, uh, of this field. 
And here's another view of this. I'll give you several pictures of the, uh, of the complexity of risk. So we have science in the center of risk assessment. And science, of course, is very important. I'll be a little critical of risk science, but I, I, you have to recognize that we need risk science and it is very sophisticated, although not perfect. Uh, and so we have issues of perception and culture and politics and power and so forth that I will uh, get into. And, and basically we see that the complexity of risk involves the fact that it's a, it results from analysis, it results from feelings, uh, it's very much influenced by culture, and, it, and there's politics that play a role as well. This is the, the complexity of risk. And risk is often at the center of conflict and controversy. This is a rather old picture, but still unfortunately uh, timely. Uh, in 1982, the United States decided to search for a site to put the, uh, the waste from 100 uh, nuclear uh, power plants that were operating at the time. And everywhere they went to say, suggest that, well, we might want to look at this region as a, the site for a, the nation's high-level nuclear waste repository, they got this reaction. No, we don't want it uh, here. And that was 1982 when they started this search. Now more than 40 years later, we still do not have a site uh, for this uh, waste. It sits uh, right on the sites of the, of the nation's reactors in pools of water waiting for, for a site to be developed. The reason that it hasn't been developed is because of of uh, politics, uh, distrust, uh, and, and, and poor uh, communication to the public about uh, what this means and what the risks are and, um, um, and failure to involve the local publics in, in this uh, type of decision. So we fight about risk issues. Uh, polarized views, controversy, and conflict have become common within risk assessment and risk management. Frustrated scientists and officials in industry and government criticize the public for risk perceptions and behaviors <coughs> that they judge to be based on irrationality or ignorance. Members of the public feel similarly angry towards industry and government, and this dissatisfaction can be traced in part to a failure to appreciate the complex and socially determined nature of risk. Let's uh, take a look at the, at the word risk uh, and definitions of risk. The risk is tricky because it has multiple definitions. Uh, for example, s sometimes when we talk about risks, we mean hazards, things that, that uh, are dangerous. When we, if we say, well, what risks should we rank in terms of high to low? Risks means hazards. Uh, another definition is risk as a probability. If we ask, uh, what's the risk of a birth defect after exposure to a toxic chemical? We're really uh, asking about how likely is that defect. defect. Uh, risk can be also be a consequence. What's the risk of letting your parking meter expire? Well, the answer is getting a ticket. That's a consequence. And finally, I think the most uh, justifiable definition is risk as potential adversity or harm. How great is the risk of riding a motorcycle? Well, here risk is some unspecified blend of probability of accident and the severity of the consequence if it takes place. So it, it involves both probability and consequence. Now, these definitions matter uh, because, uh, uh, and because we, we have these multiple definitions, it makes communication uh, more complicated and, and uh, also leads to uh, uh, controversy. So basically, what is risk? Uh, I have argued that risk doesn't exist out there independent of our minds and cultures waiting to be measured. Human beings have invented the concept of risk to help them understand and cope with the dangers and uncertainties of life. The dangers are real, but when we, we measure these dangers by something we call risk, then we're getting into judgment and subjectivity. So there's no such thing as a measurement of a real risk or objective risk. The nuclear engineer's probabilistic risk estimate for a nuclear accident or the toxicologist's quantitative estimate of a carcinogenic risk are both based on theoretical models 
whose structure is subjective and assumption-laden, and whose inputs are dependent on judgment. One way in which subjectivity enters risk assessment is the dependent on judgments in every stage of the assessment or measurement pro process, from the initial structuring of the risk problem to deciding what endpoints or consequences to include in the analysis, to identifying and estimating how people are exposed to these hazards, choosing dose-response relationships with chemicals, and so on. Uh, there's always a judgment involved. Here's, here's an example. Supposing we want to, uh, to talk about uh, the, uh, uh, mortality risk. Here's, here are two pictures of uh, the risk from uh, coal mining between 1950 and 1970 based on uh, data about the fatalities in, in coal mining. It's the same data in both pictures, but in the, uh, the, the graph on the left is the accidental deaths of miners per million tons of coal mined in the U.S. And you see that clearly uh, there's a decline. By this measure, coal mining is getting safer over time. The, on the right, we see the same data portrayed as the deaths per thousands of coal mining employees in the U.S. And here you don't see any decline. You know, it's basically flat with some ups and downs depending on whether there were major accidents in a particular year. So it's the same da data, but it tells two different stories about whether coal mining is getting, uh, getting safer. safer. Uh, this, is, this shows uh, how the measures equivalent, uh, how uh, equivalent data uh, portrayed differently can lead to different uh, conclusions. Uh, more generally, when you choose a measure of risk, there are a lot of ways of expressing uh, uh, mortality risks. Here's from examples from chemical pollution. I'm not going to read all of these, but you see, you know, you can you can portray the number of deaths that you have as your statistic per million people in the population, uh, people within a certain distance of the uh, exposure, the deaths per unit of the concentration of the chemical, and so forth. Uh, all of these are different ways that you can frame the same data. So it's not a simple, obvious uh, way, and when you frame it in different ways, you may come in different, to different conclusions. So every way of summarizing risks, for example, reflects values. For example, if you just count fatalities and you give a, a number of fatalities, you're actually giving equal weight to deaths from, you know, of young and old people, of deaths that were painful or non-painful deaths that were due to exposures that were voluntary or involuntary, uh, and also from fair and unfair benefits of exposure. That is, in some cases, the person who died was getting a benefit from the, ex you know, doing the risky activities. In other cases, they were not getting any benefit from it. Someone else was benefiting from it. So all of these, um, if you just count the deaths, you're saying none of this matters. We'll just all, they're all equal. Well, that's a value judgment that you may or may not want to, to, uh, to have in your, uh, in your assessment. So <clears throat> the nature of risk is multidimensional. The public has a broad conception of risk, qualitative and complex, that incorporates considerations such as uncertainty, dread, catastrophic potential, controllability, fairness, risk to future generations, and so forth in the risk equation. And these, these qualities uh, are value-laden. The values are involved. There are legitimate value-laden issues underlying these multiple dimensions of risk. And these dimensions need to be considered in risk policy decisions. For example, is the risk from cancer, which is a dread disease, worse than risk from auto accidents, which tend not to be dreaded? Is risk imposed on a child more serious than a known risk accepted voluntarily by an adult? Are the deaths of 50 passengers in separate automobile accidents equal to the deaths of 50 passengers in one airplane crash? These are questions that, when you to answer them, you know it involves uh, how you value different uh, different uh, causes of death and different uh, uh, con contextual factors. So, because of this subjectivity and judgment. Uh, I would say that defining risk is an exercise of power 
because whoever controls the definition of risk controls the outcome of the decision being considered. If you define risk one way, then one option will rise to the top as the most cost effective or the safest or the best. If you define risk another way, perhaps in incorporating these qualitative characteristics such as involuntary exposure and these other contextual factors that I just mentioned, you'll likely uh, get a different ordering of your recommended decisions because the, 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 the risk will look differently. So this is why, uh, it, we, why we often fight about how we define risk and, and why, uh, why there is a kind of a political element here as well as a scientific element in uh, defining risk for decision making. Now let's, uh, let's talk about uh, how we understand risk perception. So here's some questions to think about. What risks do people in your country worry about most? What important risks do they not worry about? And how do people differ in their perceptions of risk? Some of the risks that people in the United States worry about um, are terrorism, viruses such as COVID, uh, war, nuclear weapons, proliferation, crime, dangerous med medicines, lifestyle risks like uh, smoking or obesity, economic risks, jobs, health insurance, retirement income, and uh, nuclear power and uh, nuclear waste. Uh, and when I, and we're talking about risks here, note that we're talking about using the, the word risk as a hazard. Remember the definitions that I mentioned earlier. Here we're talking about hazards and we're calling them risks. Some risks in the, uh, that people in, in the United States don't worry uh, enough about are climate change and other threats to nature and environment, natural disasters, earthquakes, tsunamis, hurricanes, you know, except when they happen, then we worry about them for a short period of time. But in general, uh, we, we uh, underreact to the risks from these natural disasters. Gun violence, uh, war on nuclear weapons, uh, and endangered people people facing famine or poverty or uh, in other places uh, genocide, people who are homeless and stateless. Uh, these are some of the, uh, the risks that are uh, less salient, uh, although they should be in, uh, high in our uh, attention and concern. So risk perception can be quantified, studied, and understood. Uh, there are simple ways to measure perceptions. We can ask people to rate a particular hazard, uh, like flying an airplane, on a scale from zero, no risk, to 100, very great risk. Or we could ask them to rate this hazard on a ver ver verbal scale, such as high risk, moderate, slight, or no risk. And then we can, we can kind of average these ratings over people. Um, so uh, when we do this, we find that risk perceptions uh, are differ differ driven by concerns that are often not considered in technical risk analysis. So uh, in an early study, uh, we asked people to rate the risk to society as a whole on a zero to 100 scale. We had up to 90 items, and they included motor vehicles and pesticides and medicines and so forth. Um, and when we did this, we also asked a, a group of uh, experts to do the same judgment tasks. And then we averaged those zero to 100 ratings across people, and then we rank ordered the hazards from high to low uh, for, the, for the public or layperson sample. And for this group at this time, nuclear power was the, seen as the most risky activity, followed by motor vehicles, handguns, smoking. And uh, oh, this was a, this was a, they had 30 of these uh, hazards all together. And the lowest on, of the 30 at that time was vaccinations. That, likely has changed over the years. But you see, at the time, vaccinations were not, were not at all a, uh, a, a concern. The, uh, the experts had a very different ordering. Uh, they had nuclear power 20th out of 30 on their, on their list. So very different from the, lay, uh, the public. And interesting, another radiation hazard, uh, x-rays, which was low on the public's uh, concern, um, number 22, that was higher for the experts. That was number seven. So you see two, two activities that expose people to radiation 
had opposite, uh, had very different uh, uh, risk, uh, risk perceptions for experts and lay people and in opposite directions. Things like motor vehicles and guns were similarly rated by both, ex and smoking were similarly uh, rated by both experts and laypersons. So we also asked people to, to rate not only the risk and the benefit of these activities, but we also asked them to rate each of these activities on a, what we call qualitative concerns. Things like whether to the degree to which exposure uh, to the risk was voluntary or involuntary the degree to which the outcomes, if something went wrong, could be catastrophic or, or just more smaller or chronic non-catastrophic outcomes. We asked wh uh, whether they had a feeling of dread when they thought about this activity. This turned out to be very important judgment. Uh, we asked whether this, uh, if something went wrong, it could be fatal or not, whether the risk was known to the people who were exposed or not known, whether the consequences were immediate or delayed, uh, whether the risk was known to science or not, whether they felt that the risk was controllable by, by science or by government, whether it was an, uh, a new or an old or familiar uh, uh, risk activity, and whether the risks and benefits of the activity were fairly or not fairly distributed among those who were exposed. And when we did this, we found that every hazard has a unique profile of qualities, and this helps explain why, why in some cases, uh, hazardous judges very high in risk and, or low. And we see, for example, I was showing the, you before the fact that nuclear power and x-rays were judged uh, uh, as very different in risk uh, by, the, by the public and, and uh, the experts. And for the public, you see that, that uh, nuclear power was judged to be uh, uh, in, more, much more involuntary than x-rays more catastrophic, more dreaded, more likely to be fatal, and then down at the bottom, uh, less controllable and newer and less familiar. Um, so uh, I think this helps understand in part why nuclear power and x-rays were judged as different in risk, because they were also different in these qualities of risk that were important to people. And you can, you can lay out all these uh, judgments in a, in a spatial figure, this is a, there's two dimensions here on the, the horizontal dimension is pretty much that quality of being dreaded and, and, or not dreaded on the left. And then at the top, you have uh, risks that are judged as not well known or understood and at the bottom, the well known risks. So you see that, uh, that for example, uh, nuclear reactor accidents in the far upper right were judged as dreaded and not well known. And you th have things like bicycle and, and uh, fireworks and chainsaws down on the lower left, which are judged as you know, uh, not at all dreaded and, and familiar. And you see other risks in this space. The more you go from left to right, the more uh, the people feel that the risk is, is high and needs to be uh, uh, reduced. In fact, here's, here are the findings from these types of studies summarized. You know what. Uh, what, uh, what leads the risk to be greater and accepted more. And by the way, these reactions, this is public reactions, and you can't, there's a tendency to, when the public differs from experts to say that the public, the reason is that the public is, is ignorant and irrational. Well, uh, sure the public doesn't have the same knowledge that the expert does, but the public is reacting to these qualities and you can't say they're ignorant, ig ignorant or irrational when they are concerned about these factors because these factors reflect legitimate values. So for example, the risk is perceived as greater and acceptance of risk is reduced. If the hazard is new and unfamiliar, if exposure is involuntary, if the risk is perceived as not under one's control, if it evokes feelings of dread, if the outcomes are catastrophic, if the benefits of the activity are not highly visible or are not fairly uh, distributed among those who, who bear the risks, uh, it's also uh, perceived risk is greater and acceptance reduced if risk is posed by human failure as opposed to natural causes. We're much more concerned about uh, uh, humans causing a problem than nature, although nature, as we know, uh, can be very uh, uh, dangerous. If uh, it's, it's, it, the risk is greater, perceived risk is greater, acceptance is reduced if the potential harms 
are genetic or delayed in time, if the risk is perceived as not well known to science or to those who might be harmed, and if the officials in charge of managing risks are not trusted. So all of these things make sense and need to be considered in uh, decision making about risks. So whether you uh, think the, the risk perception is wise or foolish, uh, these perceptions have uh, impacts that are quite significant. And this, uh, this is caused by something that I'll talk about called a social amplification of risk, and uh, which is uh, linked to what, we'll, what we call ripple effects and stigma. And the fact that when something goes wrong, it's, a, it's not what, what we interpret from an event is not just how many people are hurt or injured, how much property was damaged, but, uh, but, but a, an accident can signal something about how well the risk is being managed and we call it signal value, and this drives the impacts. And these risk perception impacts can be predicted and measured and factored into decision making. So let's look first at a, a, this concept of the social amplification of risk, um, which uh, involves uh, the fact that, that even small uh, losses of life or small property damage can lead to really massive social and economic impacts uh, due to things like stigma effects and the social amplification. And it looks, uh, I'll show you in a minute what that looks like. So there, as I've mentioned, risk ev events are signals, the perceived seriousness of a mishap, the media coverage it gets, the long range cost to the responsible company, industry, or agency are determined by the mishap signal value. Signal value reflects the perception that the event provides new information about the likelihood of similar or more destructive future mishaps. So some high signal events going back in time to the Three Mile Island nuclear power accident in the United States or the Bhopal chemical uh, accident in, Fig in India, Chernobyl nuclear power accident in, in uh, Ukraine, the, in the US the 9-11 uh, terrorist attacks, uh, the Tohoku earthquake and tsunami and Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power di disaster recently in, di in di Japan. These all had tremendous long-term impacts. Um, and um, one, after one of the early nuclear power uh, reactor accidents, um, someone expressed uh, an interpretation of this, which I think illustrates well what signal uh, means. This person says, um, what truly grips us in these accounts of disaster is not so much the numbers as the specter of suddenly vanishing competence, that's the signal, of men utterly routed by technology, of fail-safe systems failing, and the specter haunts us because it seems to carry allegorical impact, import like the whispery omen of a hovering future, rather flowery language at the at the end there, but you see see the messages that are kind of between reading between the lines of the story about what happened and the immediate damage are you know what's the meaning of it and you know that uh, maybe that uh, that we're not as smart or competent as we should have been in managing these these uh, this hazard that's the signal and here's what it looks like in social amplification some event takes place there's an accident in a chemical plant. And this, this accident has characteristics, it involves you know, involuntary exposure or uh, dread risk and so forth. And it gets covered by the media, that's the next step. And, and then people interpret it uh, and look for signals. And often this leads to the loss of trust in the people who are responsible. They didn't do their jobs. There are images, you know, photographs and other images that carry affect, affect is jargon for emotion and all of all of this then leads to the impacts which are characterized here as uh, as expanding circles starting with the direct harm in the middle who are, you know how many who are the victims how many victims are there how much property was damaged all, all of that is kind of the what was typically looked at in risk assessment or risk man, risk management is the direct impacts but what social amplification says is there's an impact on the company that was responsible for managing the risk, or maybe the industry. 
uh, or maybe other technologies if this is a technological accident. And, and at the, if, if, the company, if a company is involved, it's, it's their, pro, their process that led to an accident, um, like a chemical uh, plant. Then, there, then, then the, some of the impacts at that level, the ripple effects are, you know, tougher regulation on the, on the company and on the industry, uh, uh, lawsuits, litigation, and something we call stigma, which leads to the, a loss of sales of the product for that, made by that company, or communi community opposition to having that company located near them, uh, problems with investors, you know, uh, withdrawing their, their investments from the company. All of these are, are just some examples of the impact at the company level. So, so the main point is that the impacts are far beyond the inner circle. I'll give you some uh, examples. Uh, uh, a while ago, um, uh, Tylenol, 1982 obviously, <coughs> someone uh, opened uh, a batch of Tylenol, at the time you could, you could uh, uh, open these capsules and, and uh, adulterate them with, uh, with, uh, with uh, poisonous chemicals. I think it was cyanide in this case. And there were seven deaths uh, to here, which is you know, serious, but it is, it's a small number of deaths in, as you know, compared to uh, things that happen. But nevertheless, this article uh, describes how these seven deaths and this 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 uh, this poisoning of of Tylenol led to a 1.4 billion dollars for Tylenol and for other uh, other companies that were producing these kind of pain painkillers. Pain these are the ripple effects. So uh, a product crisis like this we know now is very predictable uh, from certain factors. If the risk is seen as uncontrollable, as it was with Tylenol, I mean there's no way to control, uh, protect yourself, except not to, not to use Tylenol. Uh, and by that, it, by uncontrollable, it includes that science poorly understands the problems. There's widespread, invo widespread involuntary c exposure. The contamination is not observable to the consumers. The effects are latent, delayed in time. And the officials in charge are distrusted. Uh, that's, a, that's a bad sign and leads to this kind of uh, uh, effect on the on the product and the company. A second a major factor is the, if the risk is dreaded, if the consequences are fatal and horrific, if the contamination is long lasting, with no no easy uh, uh, seen end to it, if the consequences are uh, will happen later in the future. It's like if you're contaminated or you're exposed to some chemical that causes cancer. It's like having a time bomb within you. Um, if the risk is judged as increasing and unbounded, all of these lead to this feeling of dread. And finally, if the risk is abnormal, it's not supposed to be there in the product, and the victims are otherwise healthy and, and they're harmed. Uh, and finally, there are available substitutes. If, if one or more of these factors are, are uh, at work in, when something goes wrong, it leads to uh, large ripple effects and a crisis for the product. Uh, here's some more examples. Uh, uh, a while back, uh, British beef was associated with, with a, uh, a brain-wasting disease in cattle. Uh, they thought they saw some, some evidence in humans similar to what was happening in cattle uh, called mad cow disease. Uh, it turned out uh, uh, to be a mistake. Uh, and, but you see what happened, uh, the British beef was stigmatized as being associated with mad cow disease and the, the product was banned worldwide, obviously disastrous for the industry. That's what we call stigma. And uh, here's an example of a stigmatized image, a uh, piece of, of, of beef uh, designed to look like a skull and crossbones. This creates stigma and and uh, big ripple effects. Uh, uh, other economic ripple effects were shown in, a, in an experiment that uh, my colleagues and I did having to do with uh, <coughs> the uh, impacts of a, of a uh, uh, ter terrorist-induced dirty bomb scenario uh, in the Los Angeles downtown, and it's linked to the social amplification. So we, we 
created a mock uh, a hypothetical uh, new, uh, news story that this uh, dirty bomb rocks the financial district of Los Angeles. Um, and so a dirty bomb is when, say, a, a radiation therapy device that has radioactive material in it uh, is exploded uh, with a conventional explo uh, explosion, and it contaminates a, an area, rel rather small area, but uh, with, uh, with radiation. So uh, this was the scenario. And then we, we measured different types of economic impacts that has to do with, uh, with uh, the way people would behave with regard to this area and products in this area after this, uh, this accident. And, and basically what the analysis shows, this is a rather complex s slide, but if you look over uh, at the left, there were, there were enormous losses from ripple effects that had nothing to do with the direct impacts. So if you look at the, at the, uh, at the uh, damage you know, caused by the explosion, the property damage, or the fact that uh, business was interrupted for, for, uh, for a short period, those are direct impacts. But then the behavioral impacts are when people avoid the air area. They stop going to work in the area. They stop doing other uh, you know, recreational or other activities in this region. And this, this analysis showed that, that the behavioral impacts over 10 years were estimated at 15.8 billion, which is far greater than the direct casualties and property damage estimates, which were only $27 million. So you see that the indirect uh, ripple effects were far greater than the direct uh, damages. There is an important implication for uh, decision making, and that is if you're if you're trying to think about how much money you should spend to uh, to to reduce a risk from happening, don't just look at the direct damages. Uh, you have to uh, take into account the ripple effects, and that may uh, indicate that you should put more money into protecting protecting against this hazard than you ordinarily would if you're only considering the, the direct damages. So it has an important implication for the uh, uh, decisions about how much money to invest in protecting against a, type, a certain type of accident. An another lesson that we've learned from risk perception research is that people's ideologies and worldviews strongly influence their perception and acceptance of risk. So what are worldviews? Uh, these are an uh, aspect of uh, cultural elements that are linked to the values that we have with regard to risk and, and decision making. So in 1982, uh, uh, anthropologist Mary uh, Douglas and political scientist Aaron Woldovsky um, created a, a, a taxonomy of different types of uh, of views that people had about you know what kind of society they preferred to live in, uh, and um, and they called these cultural groups, and th and these different groups uh, attend to some risks and ignore others uh, to maintain a particular way of life that is important to them. So one of these uh, these worldviews that we call hierarchist, it's a, it's a vertical. Uh, orientation in society where some people uh, are at the top of the hierarchy and others at the, at the bottom uh, and there's a lot of inequality and uh, basically uh, this view supports a, a uh, social relations that are superior versus subordinate uh, and uh, hier hierarchists tend to detest civil disobedience because they don't want their, their uh, if they're high, high up on this uh, ladder of success, they don't want to lose that position. Uh, and so they like to keep things calm and, and, and retain their being well off. So uh, let me skip down to the third uh, uh, group here because that's the opposite of uh, the hierarchists. It's uh, people that we call egalitarians. These are people who support a broad distribution of power and wealth 
in society uh, and dislike a, a, a differentiation of, of roles from top to bottom. They want wealth and power to be distributed as broadly in society uh, as possible. Uh, so they're opposite of hierarchist uh, views. There's another uh, pair of worldviews that are opposite. Uh, one of them is individualism. Uh, and individualists support self-regulation and individual achievement and reward, and they don't like social rules that constrain individual initiative. They say, you know, uh, leave me alone to uh, pursue my my goals and ambitions as long as what I do is legal. Uh, don't don't uh, uh, hinder me with a lot of uh, regulation. The opposite uh, type of view is a communitarian view that values the needs or common good of society over the needs and rights of individuals. So these are the types of, uh, of worldviews that uh, Douglas and Wildovsky uh, uh, identified. And you can measure these, uh, these views with, uh, with questions. So here's just some examples of questions that reflect different, uh, different views. So for individualism, it's you know, do you agree or disagree that the government should stop telling people how to live their lives? And, uh, and the, third, uh, uh, the third row is the opposite, the egalitarian uh, worldview. Our society would be better off if the distribution of wealth was more equal. Um, going to the second row, uh, communitarian worldview, is that the government should do more to advance society's goals, even if that limits the freedom of individuals. And, at the bottom, we have a hierarchist uh, views. We should let the experts make all the risk decisions for society. Do you agree or disagree? So depending on how you answer this, these, you get a score on the worldviews. And, uh, and here's an example of how the worldviews influence judgments about risk. So people uh, answered these questions, and then we, we look at the, uh, their score on the egalitarian worldview, and you see and the, the, on the on the x-axis, quartile one is really people who are very low in egalitarian uh, worldview, and then at the far right are people who are high in this worldview. And then the, and they were asked a question about nuclear power. If your community was faced with a potential shortage for electricity, do you uh, strongly agree to strongly disagree that a new nuclear power plant should be built to supply that uh, electricity? And so as people uh, more and more ascribed to an egalitarian worldview, going from quartile one to quartile four, uh, they less approved of the nuclear power plant. So the hierarchists, uh, non-egalitarians, tend to like nuclear power. Egalitarians uh, dislike it. You see a, how, how the worldviews influence how we look at, at risks. Here's another example uh, with a more, with a, a recent technology called nanotechnology. This involves uh, things that are done with very tiny particles, and there are all kinds of different products and technologies can be uh, developed using uh, nanotechnology. It's viewed as a very important uh, new type of technology. And people were asked uh, uh, to, what, to what extent uh, do they uh, approve of this, uh, of this technology. And uh, uh, first, they were not given any information about nanotechnology. You see that and the, the different colors represent people who were scored by this questionnaire as being individualists, hierarchists, egalitarians, or communitarians. And so without much information, there's not too much uh, difference in the views. And then they were, then both groups, all these groups were given a, uh, information about the benefits of nanotechnology and the risks of nanotechnology, as well as a definition of it. And you see that and when they had this information, uh, in, even though they all got the same information, it split them apart. After reading about the risks and benefits, individuals and hierarch hierarchists tend to uh, focus, oops, sorry. So the information that was given split the people apart rather than bringing them together. Individualists and hierarchs, uh, when they saw the information, focused on the benefits and, and became more favorable towards nanotechnology. Egalitarians and communitarians reading the same information focused more on the risks and became less uh, favorable towards the, uh, 
towards the technology, nanotechnology. So you see that the same information was interpreted differently by people uh, according to their, uh, their ideology or worldview. So as people, uh, just to repeat, as people learn more about nanotechnology, their reactions depend heavily on their values. When exposed to balanced and accurate information, people who hold large, largely individualistic and hierarchical cultural outlooks tend to see nanotechnology as more beneficial than risky. People who hold largely communitarian and egalitarian outlooks tend to see nanotechnology as more risky than beneficial when exposed to the same information. The same polarization occurs between people who in political terms describe themselves as conservatives and those who describe themselves as liberals. They'll take the same information and interpret it in opposite ways with regard to risk. So uh, this has some implications for, uh, for, uh, for research and communication. Uh, they, it points to the need for additional research on techniques for effectively communicating information about nanotechnology or any other technology or, or, or risky activity. Because uh, people with different values are predisposed to draw different conclusions from the same information, you can't assume that simply supplying information will allow people to reach a consensus on risk from nan nanotechnology or any other uh, important hazard much less uh, a consensus that pr promotes their co common welfare. To enable informed public de de deliberation, it's essential to develop strategies for communicating scientifically sound information that makes it possible for people of diverse views to draw the same conclusions from it. Uh, this is not an easy uh, order. It's, a, it's an open uh, issue for research. How do we, uh, how do we uh, provide information in a way that uh, it helps people, it brings people together rather than uh, splits them apart. So another uh, lesson from risk perception research that is uh, important is that trust is critical to risk perception and it's also fragile. Uh, just a little uh, picture showing the importance of trusting the other, uh, the other uh, element in the picture here. Uh, Risk and trust go hand in hand. Um, and a pioneer in the nuclear power industry named Chauncey Starr pointed out that the acceptance of any risk, such as risk from nuclear power, is more dependent on public confidence in risk management than on quantitative estimates of risk. So, uh, you know, if you have trust, the path to communicating is smooth. It's easy to communicate. Uh, if, uh, if you're trusted. If you don't have trust, if you're not trusted, no form of phrasing or presentation that you make is likely to be uh, successful. Uh, and uh, trust is a fragile um, uh, element. Um, as Abraham Lincoln once said, if you once forfeit the confidence of your fellow citizens, you can never regain their respect and esteem. Well, maybe that's a little extreme. We've seen in recent years in the United States that some people uh, have uh, forfeited the confidence, but they, they still manage to, uh, to be listened to. But uh, in general, this is a, a very uh, 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 valid point that, uh, that uh, it's trust is fa fragile and it's also what we call asymmetric. And by that I mean it's far easier to destroy trust than to create it. And, uh, and this is because negative or, uh, events, such as accidents or lies, are more sharply defined. You know, you can point to them uh, more easily than uh, positive uh, things that happen with regard to risk. They tend to be fuzzy or indistinct. So, for example, how many positive events are represented by the safe operation of a nuclear power plant for one day? It's not, you know, we don't, we, we're not counting these things. It's running smoothly. Uh, you know, it's not a, a very distinct thing. Now, if that plant has an a accident, that is a sharply defined negative event. So you see the difference there in the, in the, in the uh, sharp versus fuzzy uh, aspect of experience of these things. So the, and also, uh, when a positive or negative event are pointed out, the negative or trust-destroying event 
far outweighs the positive event in terms of having an impact on your attitudes and your behaviors. And I'll show you what I mean by that. Uh, an experiment was done to demonstra demonstrate this asymmetry of trust. So uh, we created a large number of events that you might read about uh, with regard to a nuclear power plant that was located in your region. And these are like headlines in your local paper that there are good headlines, like there have been no reported safety problems at the plant during the past year, or there's a careful selection and training of employees at the plant, that plant managers live nearby the plant, and that the county medical examiner reports that the health of people living near the plant is better than average for the region. These would all, uh, these all should increase your trust in how well the plant is being managed. Now in this experiment, we also created trust decreasing events that you might read about, uh, uh, about the uh, local plant. You might read about these as headlines in your newspaper. So for example, a potential safety problem was found to have been covered up by plant officials, or the plant safety inspections were, are delayed in order to meet the electricity production quota for the month. A nuclear power plant in another state has a serious accident. Or the county medical examiner reports that the health of people living near the plant is worse than the average for the region. So we put these, pos these positive and uh, trust increasing and trust decreasing events into a questionnaire. And we ask people to go through this and for each event to rate whether or not it would increase or decrease your trust in the manager, management of the, of the plant. So here's, the, here's an example. Uh, the headline is, government inspections are conducted regularly at the plant. And then you answer, would this increase or decrease my trust in the management? And then the, the people were asked, how much would it increase or, or decrease your trust from very small, a one or a two, to a very powerful impact, a six or a seven. Uh, so this was done for each of many items. And then we averaged these items over the, all the people who were making these ratings. And I'll show you in the next slide what these averages look like. And you'll see this asymmetry uh, very uh, dramatically. Well, this is just more items of, uh, of the like. And here's, here's what, the, what the data show. So at the top are all the headlines that are good headlines, things that are good in the, uh, that are in the, in, at the plant. And you see, and, and what's being shown here by the bars is the, is the percentage of people who rated each of these headlines as having a, a six or a seven, a very powerful impact on, 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 uh, on trust in the management of the plant. And you see that there aren't very many powerful, uh, strong trust increasing impacts. At the bottom are the, the events that, that uh, might decrease uh, your trust, or that did de de decrease one's trust. And you see that the bars are much bigger. A lot of powerful impacts on the decreasing size. Here, here's what it looks like in terms of uh, some actual uh, items, data items. So um, it's the, the uh, percentage of people who, who uh, rated the impact uh, as a very small or very, uh, very large. And the first one is a, uh, is, a, is a negative item. The medical examiner reports that the health of people living near the plant is worse than average for the region. And you see on, on the right, as number six or seven, 26 and 24, 50% of the raters rated that as a, something that would have a powerful uh, impact on reducing their trust in the management of the plant. Now you just change one word from worse to better in the second item. The, the, the medical examiner reports that the, plant, the health of people living near the plant is better than the average, and you see that the sixes and sevens drop to 16% and 2%, you know, uh, a far smaller number who rate the impact as powerful, particularly as number seven drops from 24% to 2%. Same thing with regard to two other uh, 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 items that are very similar. The plant, plant is found to, last, to lack, the plant is found to lack an adequate emergency response plan. So you see that 19 and 35 percent, 
54% of the people rated this as having a powerful uh, trust decreasing impact on their perceptions. Now, supposing the plant, uh, the, 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 you see that there is an emergency response evacuation plan for the people living near the plant. This is good. This is a, a good thing. And you see only 8 and 10% see this as a powerful impact. This shows the way that uh, bad news has a much powerful, more powerful effect on destroying trust than good news has on creating it. So in the United States, for example, the way we, uh, we deal with, uh, with these, these, uh, these risks tends to amplify the, uh, the loss of trust. So we have a powerful news media that emphasizes bad or trust destroying news. We have special interest groups which focus on the bad news they want us to hear for their own uh, uh, messages that they want to have, uh, have an effect on us. We have an adversarial risk management system with a lot of litigation in the courts uh, where, which pit experts uh, testifying against other experts and criticizing each other and reducing trust. And we have a, a large number of risk assessment studies uh, uh, which sometimes disagree and, and where the science, if the science is limited, uh, shows uh, uh, problems in the assessment. And these uh, can, studies can increase perceived risk. So this is a culture that uh, we have to recognize that, uh, that uh, leads to uh, uh, distrust in society. And we have to think about how we might uh, deal with that. <clears throat> Finally, uh, cultural differences in trust are also important. Uh, we did a study comparing France versus the United States because uh, they have very different uh, attitudes towards nuclear power. Nuclear power has been a very successful technology in France and not a very successful uh, technology in the United States. And we thought, well, maybe this is because uh, the people in France uh, per, uh, uh, perceive uh, nuclear power as safe, as low risk, and people in the United States perceive it as high risk. So we asked uh, questions about risk perception in France and the U.S., along with a lot of other questions, including tr uh, questions about trust and so forth. And what we found, if you look at where the red arrow is, this is a, uh, this is a graph of the difference between France and the U.S. in the percentage of people who, who judged uh, each of these uh, various uh, elements uh, in uh, that are risk elements as as high risk, and so you see the almost the smallest difference is in nuclear power plants. So the difference in the in the reaction to nuclear power in the two countries is not about not about risk. Well, what is it about? Well, we've got some other items that show uh, issues of of trust in in experts, for example. So you see uh, the United States is in blue and France is in in Read and you see the, the question is, do you agree or disagree that decisions about health risks should be left to the experts? And what we're looking at here is the percentage of people who, who agree. So much greater agreement that uh, we should leave uh, health uh, risks to experts in France than the U.S. Um, another question, I have very little control over risk to my health. People in France uh, say they don't have control but obviously that's okay with them because they, they'll leave it to the experts, let the experts have the control. The U.S., the people in the U.S. feel that they don't have control and they don't trust the experts. And finally, a uh, question about, uh, tr directly about trust in experts. We can trust the experts and engineers who build, operate, and regulate nuclear power much higher in France than in, in the U.S. So we see elements of, tr of, of trust in, in experts and issues of control. As, be, as underlying why uh, nuclear power has been far more successful in France than in the United States. So uh, let me uh, conclude this lecture by just giving a quick summary of these items that I've talked about that, uh, that uh, demonstrate the complexity and importance of risk and risk perception. So we talked about what is risk. Uh, there are many definitions of risk and definition of risk can change decisions. Perceived risk can be measured and studied scientifically. Psychometric studies of risk perception have led to an appreciation of the complexity of risk and the importance of values and trust. We've seen that risk is subjective, value-laden, and inherently controversial. That defining risk is an exercise of power and politics. 
that risk perceptions, whether they rise or foolish, have immense consequences for health and safety and economic costs and benefits. So uh, thank you for following uh, me on this lecture, and I hope that uh, the information that I've provided will help you think about and manage risk uh, better in, in your life and in the life of your communi community and your, uh, your society. Thank you very much. Here are a few uh, references that you might want to uh, check to learn more about what I've talked about. Uh, and again, thank you very much.